Okay, I've started the recording, so at the top of the hour you can start, and you're live also. Tanya, we are ready. Good afternoon. Um, hello, ladies and gentlemen, wherever part of the world you are. Um, we welcome you at Humor. Humor is. Um, <laughs> Humor is the Institute for Humanities in Africa, one of the major research institutes based at the University of Cape Town. And we have a series of programs, um, seminars, we have workshops, we organize conferences, and we have major research streams. And we have various um, researchers of different um, caliber, different um, categories working on these various streams. I would urge you to visit our websites. There is a rich harvest of information um, explaining the range of activities we are engaged in. So please, after this event, um, you're welcome to visit our website to acquaint yourself with the range of activities and programs that we will be engaged in. Today, this afternoon, we'll be starting uh, another of a seminar series. It's called the African Epistemologies Se Advanced Seminar Series. Um, this is one of the seminar series, apart from the Akaya Seminar Series, the Doctoral Seminar Series, and um, other seminar series that will be um, in launching and initiating. So this is a new seminar series we'll be launching today. And in this seminar series, we'll be um, showcasing the works of established African scholars and African who, from, who have made um, significant contributions to African scholarship from um, an interdisciplinary perspective and also from a strong epistemological um, standpoint. So that is why this seminar series is called the African Epistemologies Advanced Seminar Series. And today we have a very special guest, guest who's made sterling contributions to the course of African scholarship. He's um, distinguished himself not only on our continent, but beyond. Um, and um, he's a Pan-Africanist. He's an activist, he's a, a leader and, uh, and a builder of institutions. Um, a lot of his work is not just um, restricted to the world of ac academia, but he's also been engaged in building all kinds of bridges and networks, joining both the ivory tower and you know, the wider community. So a lot of his work and activism is involved in developing and transforming African societies and communities or wherever they are found, both in, on the continent and in the diaspora. And I'm, it's a great pleasure and privilege to introduce Professor Tony Oluwa Tony Falola, Ishola Falola. Welcome, Professor Falola. But before I do so, I'd, I'd also like to talk a bit about his background and the, more specifically about his work, what he's been doing and why he's very important in the sort of series we are launching today. Professor Falola is a professor of history at the University of Texas in Austin. 
He is a um, university distinguished um, teaching professor. He is also the holder of the chair of Jacob and Francis Sanga Mosica uh, chair in the humanities. He has been um, a, the president of the Association of African Studies in the US. He was general secretary of the Historical Society of Nigeria. He was vice president also of the UNESCO Trade, Trade Route um, Project. These are some of these um, major academic positions he has held in various parts of the world. In addition to having won at least 30 major life achievement awards. In, including, in, in addition to that, he has also been awarded 14 honorary doctorates in various parts of the world. And I don't know, I think he's published either as author, co-author or co-editor, at least 200 books. About, is it 200 books now or about 250 books? Not articles, books, How, you know. So I, so he's um, a, a, much, uh, a very exemplary guest to have on this program, on this series. And it's my pleasure to welcome him once again to launch a series and he'll be speaking today on the topic, the decolonial moments, which is much, he's um, well qualified, well, you know, appointed to speak on. So I take this opportunity once again, ladies and gentlemen, to introduce you to Professor Oluwatoin Ishola Palola. Welcome, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Let me start with words of sympathy for the fire damage, especially to the library and to your collection. I know that library. I wasn't just reading about it. I can relate to the place. And um, whenever you call on us for whatever small contributions we can make, we will try our best. It is the second um, major library that we will lose back to back within a short period of years. We lost the entire library of the University of Joss, including my extensive e collection that I was privileged to donate to them. We hope that some of this um, will be prevented. And talking about libraries, the implosion of the Sahel, many of you are aware has done tremendous damage to libraries there. You may recall that as President Tabo Mbeki uh, used his presidential power resources of South Africa to contribute to the rebuilding of some of that library, including that of Timbuktu. So you and I, we, we hold it a responsibility to take this more seriously. I need to express my gratitude. It's a long history now that many of you may not be aware that after 1994, I was one of those scholars tapped to become a vice chancellor in a South African university when they were looking for people. And Sam Nolushongo, my friend, was appointed president of um, Vitz, but he died. He had cancer and he died before he could take over the appointment. Between then and now, the excitement for Africa and now xenophobia is, 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 is a very big difference, a gap that is very troubling. That someone was tapped to be vice chancellor years later will be leading a committee to settle conflicts. I was part of a delegation put together to resolve them um, xenophobia and to calm down communities in South Africa. And this is an issue we need to return to 
uh, at some point. Many of you may not remember that Amina Mama and Nuru Farah used to be there. I was their guest. It was my room. I did a nomination for Nuruddin Farah to win for the Nobel Prize, which unfortunately he has not received. Nuru Farah and um, Ngugi Wationgo, I think they deserve our movement to keep nominating and renominating them for the Nobel Prize. It's always a lot of work. Many of you may not be aware that a committee was set up uh, for showing God to win that award. It was nominated and nominated and nominated. It is not a nomination you do once and you forget about it. So these things requires a lot of work and we must keep doing this work. I mean, Amama subsequently moved to California, is now the Nkrumah professor in Ghana. We must always remember them. And of course, our good friend, friend of um, the host, Ari, we lost him. Ari was here, we invited him here for a semester, a great scholar, a great poet. Uh, we cannot but remember him and his achievements and his contributions on an occasion like this. And of course, many of you may not remember that when your history department celebrated its 100 years, I was invited as a keynote speaker to mark the occasion. Uh, so my relationship with Cape Town University is long and I'm an honorary professor there. So I'm not an outsider. I'm speaking now as an insider, giving an insider's seminar uh, to my friends and my colleagues. And our host, Professor Osha, we've gone a long way. We've gone a long way. Our lifestyles are not the same. I'm more of a street guy, he's more of a gentleman. But whenever I was in Pretoria, he would pop crawl with me. I was able to do it, I don't know. Because as I'm drinking my brandy and wine and Heineken, he would just be drinking water. And I will keep drinking, but he would never be bored. And I'm not talking about 8 p.m. in the night, I'm talking about deep into the night. Uh, and through that, we've engaged in so many long conversations on African studies, so long. Uh, and um, at one time, he was even planning to write a book on me. So he knows me sometimes more than I know myself. Uh, and it's I'm written. still writing it, Prof. I'm still writing it. <laughs> so let me do a commercial because of but because I normally do this commercial. If you have a manuscript, please send it along. Uh, I'm very quick in taking decisions. I manage series for Carolina Academic Press, broadly defined. Many people have published there. Celesa publishes diaspora book there. I manage a series for Rutledge on Global Africa. If you have a manuscript. And recently I introduced Global Africa test books. We'll be launching more than 20 test books if that is your interest. If your interest is in monograph, I've published many of our colleagues in South Africa. I manage a series for Pargrave on history and modernity. I've published many of our colleagues. Ndlovu, I saw some Ndlovu name, names here, Siviso. I manage a series for Roman and Littlefield uh, with more interest in younger scholars. I manage a series for the University of Cambridge Press on identities, if you do identities. I manage a series for the University of Rochester Press, which means you can send your manuscript direct to me instead of going through the press, which makes your life easier. And more recently, 
and this will interest uh, Professor Osha. I've just created a series with Bloomsbury on creativity in the area of literature and songs and music. In other words, there is no manuscript you can think of in the humanities and social sciences that you cannot send to me. Uh, and I would be very quick. If you send me a proposal and two chapters, I'll be glad to arrange an advance contract for you. The Bloom's Free One is because people who do poetry and creative work, sometimes they don't have as many opportunities. And Bloomsbury, you are aware that the publishers of Harry Potter, the Harry Potter series. And um, I have myself two forthcoming books with them, one on Wale Shoinka, which will be released in three months, and the other on Fela. And the reason why you do things like this is to say that if you manage the series, this is a kind of book, of books that you are looking for. So uh, that's a little bit of commercial. And now the business of the day, the decolonial moments. But I have to introduce a preface to that. So careers are divided. When you are young, you're seeking prestige. And you do what the academy wants you to do, and then you become a full professor. In my own case, I became a full professor a long time ago, 1988 or there about at the age of 35. So this was 30 something years ago. If I did not have passion for the job, I would have burnt out. If I wasn't interested in the academy, I would just have burnt out. But each moment I renew myself. And in the process of that renewal, I take a big topic and I break them into pieces and I write many books on them. That's my own strategy. So if you see my CV, you have to study it very carefully. So as I got into the last phase of my career, this is my last phase. Before COVID, I was contemplating on retiring at 70. And I'm two years down to becoming 70. People say, you don't look it. Well, <laughs> that's my age. And then I told myself, let me close my career. So I'm doing legacy projects. In those legacy projects, I said, okay, let me return to where I started from, which is Yoruba history. Let me do Nigeria, which I'm doing at the moment. Oxford will be releasing my handbook of Nigeria before the end of the year. In a month's time, the University of Cambridge Press will release a long book of 700 pages, Understanding Nigeria. And I'm revising a previous book for them. And finally, I am doing what is called works of retrospection in which what you're basically doing is you're accumulating by way of reflection so many things. And as I accumulate these reflections, it gets me back to the subject of the, of the day, decolonization and decoloniality. Don't ask me, I am done it, I'm doing it. In the next one year, Two books of mine will be released on religious beliefs and knowledge systems, which is to look at witchcraft and rituals, divination, and what knowledge do they embed and do they enshrine. So Bloomsbury will release one, and Roman and Littlefield will release the second one. This is done there in press. Then I, if one or two of you have been to my house, it's a museum, and many of you have read my memoir, two volumes, two or four have been released, and I accumulate my museum and my memoir into a book called Autoethnography and 
epistemology. In an essay, called Ritual Archives, I argue that we have archives that in here that are based in people, in our people, and in our objects, like the bits you wear, the gods and goddesses. But because we've privileged, I'm not reading this, by the way, I don't read my lectures, I just speak to them. So the recording may show some kind of um, fragmentation because I'm not reading it. I don't, I don't follow, I don't read lectures, I speak to lectures. So uh, I argued that embodied in individuals is an archive. That you listening to me today is an archive. Either that you don't see yourself that way or you cannot milk yourself that way. And in autoethnography and epistemology, which the University of Cambridge will publish next year, I converted myself into an archive. This is a project different from a memoir. Don't confuse them. And when I was planning this book, I agonized a lot, I agonized a lot, a lot of agony. And I saw one of the audience here, members in this audience, and I said, look, can you read this first chapter for me? I saw him, he's one of the listeners from Lagos. And he read it, and he gave me the confidence that I could do this project. And I kept initial essays. I'm a collector of a shoe. If you come to my house, you're going to find many sculptures of a shoe. In fact, members of the Redeemed Church, members of the Redeemed Church want their members not to eat in my house. There is a house of, <laughs> of gods, <laughs> of, of a pagan. That's a conversation for another day. And I wrote an essay on those subjects and kept testing it. And when people give me confidence, I completed the book and Cambridge will release it. This is an important preface because all those projects are decolonial by themselves. Writing books in which I say, I'm not going to the public record office in London as I did before. I'm not going to the Nigerian National Archives as I did before. I will look for other archives as in the clothes that I'm wearing is an archive, but you may not know it's an archive. You may not know that this cloth is an intellectual project. So we've damaged ourselves tremendously. We were damaged by, by a, a, an epistemological violence. And then we damage ourselves by not recognizing what could constitute epistemologies for us. So it's, 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 it's a multiple damages we've done. Because if you don't see this cloth as an intellectual project, that means you, 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 you are ignoring studies on art, studies on fabric, ideas on patterns, ideas on fractals, and how fractals form the basis of some of what we subsequently called computer knowledge. The, the hair, I did a chapter on women's hair and women's head. Those are fractals. If you go to South Africa, Pretoria, and you look at the, the hair of the woman, that are, those are books that have not been written because you cannot put those hair and patterns together unless you see them as intellectual projects. They are not neutral. They are not epistemologically neutral. By way of aesthetics, they are not neutral. Now, if you lack the capacity to intellectualize them, that's a different issue. But you cannot just see that head and that design and miss it. It's, it's, an, it's a way of thinking. It's a way of thinking. And why in particular do they focus on the head? A focus on the head leads to in various directions, destiny, the, the power of the inner head, the power of essence. Those are, decolon you're decolonizing. 
you are inserting yourself into a conversation. So that's one. And what we do in the academy, we respond to conquest. All black studies is about that. It's a counter discourse. We have to respond to conquest. We, we respond to race and subsequently post-colonial, we respond to development in terms of the rapidly changing ideas on the post-colonial. We respond to the post-colonial incredibles. South Africa is, is, is at that moment now. And we respond to issues around Africa in a changing global world order. As that world order changes, they force us to reflect on our own ideas. Either we take the ideas they generate for us or we respond to them and do counter narratives, uh, what um, Mamdani calls history by analogy. And he wants people, he wants them to be careful about history by analogy. If we accumulate everything we do, either as history by analogy or history by conquest, or history or studies by our own creative thinking, we are enveloped in three big ideas. Three big ideas. We are responding to the first idea, a continent without history, the dark continent. That, that was all the knowledge up until the 19th century. These are backward people. History, a continent without. That continent without, we were deeming, I don't have to repeat it. And those narratives continue. And we responded to it. And in responding to it, it led us to nationalist historiography. That is a contest. So, the history without, in leading us to that nationalist historiography, there is a moment that we don't talk about, which is very unfortunate because we went straight to DK Ajayi, the University of Ibadan. In the process, we isolated the role of Western universities. So as LSE, Birmingham, and we privilege people like KODK. Yes, we appreciate their contribution, but we left out an entire library, an organic library. And as I'm talking to you now, is a book that is waiting to be written. African American intellectuals the black organic scholar before the 1940s. And some people are from South Africa as well. And I would just, they were writing about Africa within the context of Pan-Africanism. Later on, Mississippi Senghor, within the context of negritude, these were done outside of the university. They were not professors. And I will check one major example that people should, they undermine. The definition of Africa that we know holds to Du Bois. It was not an European creation. The European creation, Leo Frobenius, the Bilad al Sudan, the land of the black, this Arabic, formula, European Arabic formulation of Africa. If you teach African studies, the formulation in which you link you, you do Africa from Cape Town, South Africa, to the pyramids in Cairo. That formulation hold to Du Bois. Africa and the world, the world and Africa. His book was a major book. A book that I've suggested must be translated. He formulated that combination against what? against 
a coded world of blackness called Sub-Saharan Africa. He rejected that formulation. He rejected it because Sub-Saharan Africa is a code to mean blackness. It was a Washington DC definition in which they take the area of the Middle East and Egypt and North Africa, they, they, they lump it up until today in the Western Academy. North Africa, Egypt, they are not taught as part of African history. They are taught as part of Middle, Middle East history, including on my campus. And you must be very sensitive to that. Du Bois said, no, you cannot do that. The organic black intellectuals were the very first and we don't pay them credit. If you look at African history syllabus, African sociology, they were the ones who created the topics for us. They, they predated us in charting out the subjects we now teach. When I wrote the book that many of you use, Key Events in African History, the topics you saw there were created before the birth of the University of Ibadan. We don't pay respect for them. Question and answer time, you ask me why, I will tell you. Because the dual combination of how race interjects with the academy and how we also share in accepting, in accepting those. Dubois and his colleagues were the very first to talk about those kingdoms, the pyramids, the institutions, because they were writing against the context that you people are bad, you cannot manage, you don't have a history and they were showing, we have a history. They have been talking about the empires before the scholars in Makareri or Ibadan were talking about them, but we don't recognize them enough. Then as we move to the fifties, the World Bank and others, the late colonial period, when the Africa without history was challenged vigorously, then came a second major troop. And that took us a long time up until today, Africa without development. The, the reason is the colonial enterprise focus on change, although it's more of continuity, began to relate history to the idea of progress. This is a major topic which Professor Osha and his colleagues must at some point organize a discussion around. By the time we enter the 20th century, the Bolshevik revolution, the rise of Japan, the confidence of Europe, and it was crushed until it was crushed by the Second World War was based on a theological reading of history. You must always be making progress. Society is about moving forward. You are advancing. They now inserted us into that narrative. So if you go to the Zulu, 18th century, 19th century, show me an example of a jobless Zulu person. Show me an example of a Yoruba person in the 18th century who did not have a house to live. Show me the example of a Fulani man in the 18th century who did not have a job. None, none. But once you accept an index or indices of how you measure society, how you link society to notions of progress, you create a new theory of understanding yourself. Bear in mind, against the context of the colonial era, the changes that introduced and the formalization of institutions. If you formalize this education, then you become uneducated. Because you said, okay, education is about going to school, so if you don't go to school, you are not educated. You are the one who formalized it. If you formalize careers, then you are jobless if you don't leave your house in the morning. And you begin to use narratives 
that are displaced from elsewhere. Take child abuse, for instance. So if you come to my city, you see kids selling stuff. Once you, once you formulate a theory around that, you call it child abuse. The mother does not, the mother thinks is training her own daughter. The mother thinks is, the, the mother is not abusing a child. Genuinely, the mother thinks, look, I don't want to produce a lazy child. I know abuse, even in the context of that space. But the idea is that the troop of Africa without development created so many theoretical paradigms that we have to respond to, in which that without development began to structure many of what we have to do and intellectual challenges. Uh, then we have, we borrowed money, they introduced structural adjustment program, institutions became embattled, migrations and the third troop, Africa without development, Africa without governance. And that is what we have been dealing with since the 1980s. And that began to expand after 1994 into what I will talk about in which South Africa began to make his own contribution. And Mbeki began to say, I am an African, talking about Africa rising, Africa renaissance, both against the intellectual background of Africa without development, Africa without governance. And when you look at all this that I've been tracking historically, I'm not talking about sources and themes and periods, but just talking about how we've been constructing the understanding of Africa along contests that were imposed on us. And the labels, decolonizing, decolonial movements, decoloniality, the, the way they've crept into the contemporary academy began after the Second World War, aligning themselves with the project of political decolonization in which scholars were also following the, the decolonizing political movements and structuring the academy along those lines. Uh, the watershed moments were created, some of which you and I grew in, some of which were also advancing, and some of which we are leaving behind. So we have the first one in the context of after the Second World War, the emergence of a new African historiography. So many of us in this room were educated along that paradigm. We are following we were schooled under the modernization theory, Pan-Africanist perspective, national liberation projects. If you went to school in the 50s and 60s, those would be your diet. And very successful, extremely successful. That moment produced Shoinka, Achebe, and many others. Uh, and today, sometimes we see that moment as a glorious era, not just in Africa, but in the African Academy. It produced so many books, many series, Ibadan history series, Legon history series, the rise of Makerere and the left, the decolonization of English literature by Ngugi and his colleagues in Nairobi. They all fed into that era. They fed into the era of a, 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 an awareness of the relevance of pre-colonial Africa, the relevance of Egypt, of Zimbabwe, Ununu Tapa, Mfekane, Zulu, the Jihad. They fed into that. Then you have the post-apartheid. 
and the rise of African Renaissance, an emphasis on African political thought in the 1990s. Many of you may remember the big debate, South African exceptionalism. You may remember the big debate about Mamdani's inaugural lecture and things like that. That do not confuse that moment with the previous one, because in the case of South Africa, it was entering Africa. I am an African, the oversighted statement by Tabo Mbeki was relevant in which the ideas that had become popular at Ibadan, McCreary and Legon were also creeping into the South African Academy and liberating them. And they began to confront them and to insert them into their own academic project. My initial interaction with South Africa was also part of that. Uh, and then, um, this has been recently been accumulated in, in a book that emanated from a conference that um, Adike held in Johannesburg, of which I was privileged to write a paper on the Ibadan History School to that volume. Then came the moment that led us to today. The rules must fall. The rules must fall. The movement in South Africa, which we now connect to Black Lives Matter. So events of 2015 and 20, 2020 now continue the unfinished project of epistemological and racial decolonization. That is where we are now. That's where we are now. The combination of the consequences of Black lives matter and rose must fall and how issues around epistemic violence, epistemic suicide, epistemic marginalization, the epistemology of the South, they now combine and they lead to issues of how we must talk about racial decolonization. And the challenge in South Africa today, you cannot escape from the epistemological consequences of roads must fall and Blacks' life matter. And they are causing their own effect in, your, in the academy. So every moment has been new and every moment becomes transcended. 1950s to 70s, a new African historiography, protest to colonial historiography, the confidence to talk about an African liberation, decolonization of African studies, new anthropology, new sociology, in which the political independence created an enabling environment for the new African historiography. And that new enabling environment became weakened by the 1970s and 80s. What happened? Political instability, civil war in Nigeria, the, 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 the fall of Nkrumah, they changed the contest in which nationalist movements began to decline with the euphoria of independence and its historiography. The independence African nationalist historiography became faulted. They were now becoming to say that the work of Ibadan School and Legon School and others was elitist. They began to accuse them of exaggerating the past, presenting an oversimplified picture, not talking about persons, not talking about market women. And in that challenge came the rise of the dependency school, an alternative approach originally pioneered uh, outside of Africa by our colleagues in Latin America. And the, 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 the most preeminent book of that era by Walter Rodney, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, was so influential. And they began to connect that book 
to not just to radicalism, but to Marxism, to feminist scholarship, and subsequently to ecological studies, to post-colonial traditions. Uh, and th that moment, uh, the 70s and 80s, began to also produce radical students on university campuses, some calling themselves Marxists. And there were so many debates. I went to university at that moment. I, I entered the university in 1973, at the moment when the analyst school, Miller so the Marxist school, the dependency school began to grow. In my memoir of my university college, part of the tension that I will report as vigorous intellectual debates on campus. Prof, Prof yes. sorry. Would you um, spare me a moment? Can we um, just wrap up so quickly? Because we need to take um, okay. um, questions. Let me, let me I'm, I'm glad I've, I provided a long contest. Then we have the post-apartheid Renaissance period. 1990s, and and what so what is up the, the, the subjects subsequently the coloniality and epistemologies of the South. So what is happening now? So that we can wrap. What is happening now? So you find ideological divide places in South Africa, the rise of diaspora programs the rise of black studies, but you also find changes in how we train students in which some academies have shifted more to theories instead of to methodologies. In the West, you find more shift to what they call transnational history instead of to local history. And then you have quick trips to the archive we now have people who come to Johannesburg for two weeks, write their PhDs and call themselves experts. And we have, not all scholarship is connected to many of these epistemological issues. We have division. Should scholarship be about activism or should scholarship be mainstream, non-political? Those debates, are going on now. So let me end by saying that the phase, especially in South Africa where you are, is this phase of finding the appropriate challenges to older epistemologies, renewing those that we work, emphasizing issues of blackness, emphasizing issues of the relationship between scholarship and development. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Lauren Toyin Falona for such a paranomic sweep um, you know, of your presentation and which brings together various strands of your life. And life, your life was uh, a respected and well-recognized village elder, and village sage, and a distinguished global public intellectual. Thanks for that sweep. That's a, it's an amazing sweep. Um, and I'm sure from the audience, we have a lot of comments. We have a lot of questions and that would want you to field. Um, so I'd, I'd open up the floor for any questions? Okay, um, one hand has come up. Uh, Chick is here. Please, please, please ask your question. Thank Chikizia. you, doctor. Yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you very much, doctor. Uh, Prof, thank you so much for your generous uh, reflection. Um, I was actually, I broke into some kind of laughter when you mentioned the fact that um, your clothing, what you're wearing now, is a kind of um, is a kind of epistemology, is a kind of uh, is 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 a kind of archive, and I find that very fascinating and very true. It's very profound, and so I was 
wondering um, what you said about epistemological violence that, um, that have been experienced by African knowledge systems and uh, 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 development systems, which have eroded our African authenticity and integrity over the years. Um, I was wondering how you think such uh, personal uh, decoloniality could come from maybe what we wear or our indigenous identity or cultural identity, uh, whether it's something that can help um, in trying to uh, contribute to the, to the process of decoloniality in Africa. Thank you. Correct, it, it can. Uh, to those that we have not lost, some we have lost. So, so using this clothes, many people will not know that it's actually man and made. The Yoruba call it Ofi, is woven. It's, it's made in strips and then joined together. You have to weave it. Uh, you can't go to the store and say you want to buy it. They, they're just in, um, in strips like this. They're, they're woven. And, and um, the, the women who weave them, first of all, think about it intellectually. And before you design it, and so many things you can do. The Chinese have entered the market, of course, so you can buy the fake ones. If you go to Ghana now, you can buy the fake in tea. So, but more than that, the theoretical, look at it this way. This was a continent that had been there for millions of years. Pose the question, if they didn't have medicine, they would have all died. If they didn't have clothes, if they have food. So communities, when you, historically, when you hear about settlements, living in a certain place, that place offers them food and medicine at the minimum. Otherwise, they will not live there. You may have lost the discipline. You may have lost the knowledge. But why would human beings voluntarily say, I want to live where when I have a disease, I am going to die? That's anti-human. Why would they live in a place where they won't get water? They won't do that. Where they won't get food. Now, as they encounter other people, they introduce new diseases into them. They may, their knowledge and the environment may not be able to solve that. Take COVID. Our people have been using food as medicine for centuries. If you, I don't, if you, come, if you go to a city like Kano now, you're going to find Tuareg medicine men from the Sahara. They've been going there from the Trans-Saharan trade. You're going to find Yoruba people carrying food there. The centrality of bitter leaf and onions and hot pepper, they just didn't come just like that. So the Yoruba like hot pepper, and they will say that, or the ego like bitter leaf. No, these are mechanisms that were invented before you and I were born to cope with health issues. And subsequently, we began to realize what they are doing with hot pepper. We began to realize that kulano that grows in the forest have meanings in the desert. We began to realize that that bitter leaf has meaning, bitter kula has meaning, that kula not has meaning. Kula not to chew in the desert and the savannah because it, re it releases saliva into you. We began to realize that people are not just eating hot pepper because they like it, but that it has consequences for bacteria. Or COVID came, they said, is new, virus is new. Virus is not new in Africa. We've been having virus regime. We had virus courts, what you call shamanism and diviners. The, the Yoruba god, god of smallpox was a virus. It was a virus cult. We have been having vaccinations for centuries. We just call it incisions, in which you take the medicine faster to your blood system. 
We have been having quarantine. We have been having social distancing. That's how we've been curing leprosy, epilepsy, uh, depression. So, but they come and relabel it or take my name to Infalola. It's an Anglo tradition to have a last name. We didn't use our last name. So if you go to Nigeria, you are going to hear many people behind Belu and Mohammed. I mean, Okano, Shagari. Shagari, the president of Nigeria. That's the name of your village. The British ask you, what's your last name? No, you, I don't have a last name. Where do you come from, Okano? What's your first name, Aminu? So your name is Aminu Kano. Or take food. Many African cultures used to move towards vegetarianism. The cow that is now causing trouble in Southern Nigeria was brought by the railway. They were not eating the cattle before. Even pastoralists were not slaughtering their cattle. They were feeding on the milk. So are we, were we eating three times a day before? No. Which farmer will wake up in the morning and go and pan the yam and be eating it? Or which, which craftsman will wake up in the morning and say, let me start by frying for four pieces of eggs and then bread? Which work is he going to do? We've been exercising. I, I, I was a farmer when I was in elementary school. You have to walk. How do you walk to your farm four miles, walk back? Which exercise do you need? If you are pounding millets, where are you going to get the weight from? So we've been doing things that we dismantled subsequently. We dismantled them. We dismantled the organic in virtually everything. We don't replace them. And we are now struggling to reclaim them. And in that struggle to reclaim them, we have to meet the challenges of other ideas. Sometimes we don't test them. When, when, when the, world, uh, the World Bank went to, was testing nutrition, it chose where it came from in the 50s. And he looked at their food and he said, this is good food. This is very good food in which they were concentrating on beans and beans and beans. If you give them beans now, they will say, where is Indomie? If you give them food now, they will say, where is the rice? They were not frying their food because the, the, the day market was closed. We had the day market, it was daily. It was later that I had, they began to say organic food. That was what I was eating when I was young. The, the markets were daily, but we disconnected ourselves from all those. And, and, and as we replace them, we create consequences for ourselves and we are now struggling to do that decolonizing. And the extent to which we can do it is dependent on the aspects that you turn to. Thank you so much. Um, I, I think we, any more questions? Um, uh, this is such a rich and exciting session. I suspect we would have more questions. Any more questions, comments, responses, please? Um, it's Linga, can I ask a question? Please go ahead. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, sorry for the noise outside. Uh, I'm trying to, it's just a straightforward question. I'm very interesting with your, your presentation, but my question goes as follow. Um, what would it mean to think about Africa differently during this period of decolonial? And also, where would we found a form of language or conceptual, a conceptual uh, methodology, methodology, tools or strategy, which we could use to do so? And how do we move away from the structure of uh, of the dominant framework of the idea about Africa. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so at this very moment, some people are moving away and some people are doing integration. Uh, and we have to encourage all of them. So 
take what young people are doing, and I will start with Black Panther. I do not know whether the movie got to South Africa, in which the Black Panther, in which um, they set up this conflict leading to the discovery of this small equipment that will liberate Africa. The Black Panther took Pan-Africanism of Du Bois and Nkrumah and other and Sese, elevated blackness to a good height, recognized the problems that, that Africa has and says, how can we solve it? Cleverly, they put a lot of conflicts there with James Bond and they use science and technology to bring victory. It's a very good way to go because the older generation are not going to think like, the younger generation won't think like me. And we also have to recognize that. Some years ago, I did a book on the power of African culture. When they were trying to translate it to, into Portuguese in Brazil, I was discouraging them, but they went ahead and translated it. But I will not write that book again like that because that older culture, the ground has shifted. That older culture doesn't work more like that. To replace it, are elements you find in that movie, The Black Panther. If you have not watched it, go and please watch it. So we now have the concept of the cosmopolitan African. And we have Africans like Apia who subscribe to that notion that in that cosmopolitanism, are we not exaggerating Africanity? But we have the counter, the Afrocentric scholars, some of them are my colleagues in South Africa. Molefia Shanti is very famous, tapping into the older work of Chekanta Diop. And they believe that new colonial discourse is the right approach to achieve an inclusive African emancipation. And in that African emancipation, they see at the very core of it, African identity. Now that identity will provide cohesion and it will supply the basis for an African epistemology and epistemy. And they keep saying, let us find an Afrocentric solutions to African social economic problems. Reimaginative ideas, recreative ideas. So your colleague in South Africa, like Achille, will agree with that dimension. But his argument is that that's just a first leg in this challenge that I'm responding to the trajectory of your question. That the second challenge will be you and I must create homegrown theories and concepts. As Mbembe argues, if we succeed in the first one, creating an African, uh, the first one of challenging Western centric, but we don't create alternative theories, we go back to the challenge that fed your question. We have to keep borrowing. So you and I, when they established the African Studies Association in Africa, I was privileged to be their first keynote speaker. And my argument was that we must turn all our own ideas into theories. What you call theories, have, they start as localism whether it's Islam or Christianity. So the very first day I read Foucault, I was asking myself, but I knew the very concept of Foucault as far back as in elementary school, that power was diffuse. Yes, <laughs> I already knew that living in a polygamous compound, I already knew how to do that, <laughs> how to balance the gender and the gender power. In a, in a household. And I said, but I knew this, I knew this. If you accumulate many Yoruba proverbs and you accumulate them, you will see that 
the missing link is the lack of elevation to theoretical paradigm. And as, 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 as this younger generation move ahead, they're talking about Afropolitanism, because we now have Africans who don't speak African languages. We only have, we now have Africans, the only thing that tell us the African is the name. So they began to develop ideas on Afropolitanism. And today, as I'm speaking now, we now have the idea of African futurism. And it's a chapter that I, I wrote to close my long book. In this African futurism, it advances the project of decoloniality. But they are saying, why can't we take, as in the example of the clothes in the first question, why can't we take traditional indigenous instruments of articulation and cohesion, as in spirituality, as in myths, as in folklore, as in our indigenous techno-scientific innovation, and deploy them, deploy them, and I'm, I'm repeating that, in their capacity to drive to address and actu actualize future possibilities. Take the masquerade, for instance. Nobody, you, can't, you are not going to tell anyone now that the masquerade comes from heaven. Nobody is going to believe that. But the very idea of the masquerade, the very idea that it embodies, the fabric it wears, the language, the innovations, the cultural parameters, the stories, that you can actually harness all of them. In other words, there's nothing to throw away in those Zulu ideas. Don't throw them away, but harness and actualize their future possibilities. The power of the language. They can be converted to movies. They can be, uh, the museum in, um, in Pretoria, not far away from UNISA, took a South African indigenous mythology of creation and converted it into a 3D movie. Nobody has said, okay, the Yoruba believed that a chain was thrown from heaven with a chicken to create the hearth. It's a story that they have been telling before I was born. Afrofuturism says, don't throw away that story. Why don't you extract it for its future possibilities? It can be in Hollywood. It can be in a movie. You can use it as Shoyinka used Ogun to win the Nobel Prize. If Achebe did not understand the Igbo language, there'll be no things fall apart. It's not going to be possible. So Afrofuturism is saying, these are great ideas. Check them, match them with the possibilities of the fourth industrial revolution and use them to move forward. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Prof, for such a rich, thought provoking and stimulating presentation. I mean, it's a presentation that like, like I said earlier, combines the skill and expertise and wisdom of a very accomplished village elder, which a global public intellectual bringing such um, a diverse um, skill with um, sub several cultures, you know, both African and of course um, other cultures of the world to bring us this rich um, presentation of knowledge. Um, we are really grateful at Shuma for your time, your resources, your energy, and your generosity, most of all, and in sharing your knowledge and wisdom with us. And um, on that note, it's a pity we can't continue the session because we've run out of time. Uh, we, in fact, we've overrun our time. Usually we have our seminars for one hour. So I'd like to, Thank you very profoundly, like I said, on behalf of Huma and UCT, for making time to come and talk. And so we will, we'll see you 
Um, that's to our audience. We thank you to our audience for your patience and your time. And we'll be having an, another session, hopefully towards the end of the month. So thank you so much again to our special guest, Professor Lorontoni. Lorontoni. Thank you so much, sir. Let thank me you. let me return the, the thank you by thanking many people. Many of the names here, I know them. I saw uh, the professor from um, UNISA, saw faces from Europe, Nigeria. I saw a dean from Nigeria. My good friend, Samuel Toba from Canada, Abatunde. Uh, thank you so much, and I'll be happy to be part of this same um, series and i will always join you i'm very grateful bye bye now bye bye thank you bye -bye.